Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're exploring the history of one of Microsoft's most famous missteps, WinFS. Full disclosure, I was there on the NT team at the time, but I wasn't personally working on it. Our shell would support it, but my team was just a consumer of WinFS. But even that begs the question, what was WinFS? Well, let me set the stage. Back in the early 2000s, a new problem was emerging for PC users. The proliferation of digital devices like personal computers, cameras, and the newly nascent smartphone market had unleashed an avalanche of data upon users. Documents multiplied, photographs accumulated, and emails poured into inboxes with relentless regularity. Hard drives, once normally measured in megabytes, now boasted capacities sometimes into the gigabytes, yet the tools to manage this burgeoning digital bounty remained stubbornly rooted in the past. This data deluge was compounded by the rise of the internet, which introduced new types of content like MP3s, digital videos, and web archives, further straining traditional file management systems. For example, a 2003 study estimated that the average PC user was then managing over 10,000 files, a number that was doubling every few years. The traditional file system, a hierarchical structure of folders and files, had served us admirably in the simpler days of computing. However, by the year 2000, its limitations were becoming painfully evident. Users found themselves mired in a web of directories, searching futilely for a misplaced document or struggling to recall the cryptic naming conventions they had developed a year prior. After all, a lot of people's conception of data management involved saving all their files to the desktop and then, maybe once a year, pushing them down into a new folder they create called the old desktop, just like they did last year and the year before. The system back then offered no insight into the relationships between your files. There was no way to connect a photograph to the event it captured or an email to the project that it was about. It was a method of storage and not much different from a digital shoebox at times. Microsoft stepped into this fray as the company perceived not merely a problem, but also an opportunity. A chance to redefine how people interacted with their digital possessions. And thus was born WinFS, or Windows Future Storage, a project of such audacity that it sought to bridge the chasm between the file system and the database, promising a future where data was not merely stored, but also understood. The name WinFS itself was a nod to its forward-looking ambitions, with future storage signaling Microsoft's intent to leap beyond the constraints of existing file systems like FAT32 and NTFS. Microsoft's ambition with WinFS was nothing short of revolutionary. The company envisioned a storage system that transcended the rudimentary capabilities of the predecessors. Where traditional file systems had treated data as isolated entities, simple files strewn across the digital landscape of your hard drive with little regard for their meaning, WinFS attempted to imbue them with structure and context. It proposed to transform files into items, each enriched with metadata capable of forming relationships with other items, much like entries in a relational database. The whole idea was partly inspired by earlier research projects like the Cairo Operating System, a 1990s Microsoft initiative that aimed to integrate object-oriented storage, but was shelved due to its complexity. WinFS was, in some ways, Cairo's spiritual successor carrying forward the dream of a smarter file system. This concept drew inspiration from the world of enterprise computing, where relational databases had long proven their worth. In such systems, data is organized into tables with rows and columns delineating records and their attributes. In a relational database, as you might have guessed, relationships can also be defined between columns and between tables. A user might query the database for all customers in a specific region or all transactions exceeding a certain amount, and the system would respond with precision. Microsoft sought to bring this power to the desktop, enabling users to ask sophisticated questions of their own data, like show me all the photographs from my 2003 vacations or list every document related to the quarterly report. Now, this was long before AI, so the system wasn't going to figure it out on its own. So to achieve it, WinFS introduced the notion of schemas, templates that define the properties of the various data types. A schema for a contact might include fields for name, address, and telephone number, while one for a document might specify the author, date, and keywords. These schemas allowed applications to store and retrieve data in a consistent way, making for a unified environment where emails, files, and contacts could coexist easily. Relationships between items further enrich this ecosystem, for example, linking a memo to its recipients or a song to the album it came from. The schemas were built using XML, a then-emerging standard for structured data, which allowed for flexibility and interoperability across applications. This was a pretty forward-thinking choice, as XML would later become a cornerstone of web services and of data exchange in general. The promise of WinFS extended beyond organization to accessibility. With its relational foundation, the system would support advanced search capabilities, allowing users to sift through their data with unprecedented granularity. 
This was not merely about finding a file by its name, but about uncovering information based on its content, its context, and its connections, a leap forward from the rudimentary search tools of the era. For example, WinFS theoretically could allow users to search for all emails I sent to Joe about the budget last month, a query that would have been pretty much impossible with the basic file search in XP. This vision aligned with Microsoft's broader strategy to compete with emerging search giants like Google, which was beginning to dominate web-based information retrieval. Achieving this vision would require Microsoft to forge a new path, melding the strength of two disparate technologies, the file system and the relational database. WinFS was constructed atop NTFS, the robust file system underpinning Windows, and drew upon the capabilities of SQL Server, Microsoft's enterprise database platform. This hybrid approach aimed to marry the efficiency of file storage with the analytical prowess of a database, creating a system that could handle both the raw data of files and the structured metadata of items. And central to the WinFS concept was the notion of a store, a repository akin to a database where items resided along with their metadata and the relationships. Multiple stores could exist, each tailored to a specific data type or user need, and a synchronization engine promised to keep them aligned across devices, a prescient nod to the multi-device future that lay ahead. The synchronization feature was particularly visionary as it anticipated the rise of cloud computing and of mobile ecosystems, where data needed to flow seamlessly between laptops, phones, and servers. Yet this fusion of technologies was fraught with complexity. File systems excel at managing large, unstructured data blocks while databases thrive on structured queries, relationships, and generally smaller items. Uniting them demanded solutions to a number of new problems. Early in its development, WinFS revealed the magnitude of these challenges. The system's reliance on database operations for even basic file tasks introduced significant overhead, slowing processes that users had come to expect to be largely instantaneous. A simple act like saving a document could become a bottleneck as WinFS processed the metadata and the relationships behind the scenes. Moreover, the advanced querying capabilities, while powerful, demanded computational resources far exceeding those of the average Windows PC back in the early 2000s. A typical machine at the time might boast 256 megabytes of RAM and a single-core processor, hardly sufficient for the ambitions of WinFS. This hardware mismatch was a significant barrier as most consumers were still using machines designed for Windows XP's lighter footprint. WinFS was unveiled as a cornerstone of Longhorn, the codename for the operating system that would later become Windows Vista. Longhorn itself was a grand endeavor, promising a sleek new interface, bolstered security, and a host of enhancements to modernize Windows. WinFS, though, was to be its crown jewel, a testament to Microsoft's forward-thinking ethos. At the 2003 PDC or Professional Developers Conference, the company offered a tantalizing glimpse of WinFS in action, demonstrating its ability to organize and query data with elegance and ease. Whether it was real code or macromedia shockwave, I have no idea, but the audience was captivated, envisioning a future where digital chaos gave way to order. Bill Gates himself championed WinFS, describing it as a fundamental advance in how people will interact with their information during his PDC keynote, underscoring the high expectations within Microsoft's leadership. Yet beneath the surface, the Longhorn project was straining under its own weight. The integration of WinFS with the operating system proved a complicated task as developers wrestled with compatibility issues and performance bottlenecks. By 2004, the timeline had slipped and Microsoft faced a stark choice. Delay Longhorn further or scale back its ambitions. In a pivotal decision that we discussed in our Longhorn episode, the company announced that WinFS would be decoupled from the initial release of Windows Vista, relegated to some future update. This move preserved the Longhorn schedule but cast a shadow over WinFS's prospects. Development continued with Microsoft releasing beta versions of WinFS to developers in 2005 and 2006. These betas showcased the system's potential, allowing testers to experiment with its relational features and search capabilities. However, they also laid bare its shortcomings. Performance remained sluggish, particularly with large data sets, and the system's resource demands, requiring at least 256 megs of RAM, placed it beyond the reach of most users. Feedback from the developer community was mixed. Admiration for the vision was tempered by frustration with its practical limitations. By mid-2006, the fate of WinFS hung in the balance. Windows Vista was nearing completion, yet WinFS remained an unfinished product, its promise overshadowed by persistent technical hurdles. Microsoft itself was also contending with external pressures. Google's ascendancy in search and web services demanded a strategic focus on immediate priorities, not more long-term experiments. The resources devoted to WinFS, both human and financial, were substantial and the return on that investment remained elusive. So internally, WinFS faced competition for resources from other Microsoft initiatives, such as the development of other .NET framework and early cloud computing efforts like Azure, which promised more immediate market impact. In June 2006, Microsoft delivered the final verdict. 
WinFS would not ship as a standalone product. Instead, its innovations would be folded into other offerings such as SQL Server and components of Windows Vista. Quinton Clark, a senior director at Microsoft, addressed the decision with some candor. WinFS is a complex technology and we've learned much from the journey. While it will not be delivered as originally conceived, its contributions will endure in other forms. We wish it well in its new adventures. Or maybe that last sentence is mine. This announcement marked the end of WinFS as a distinct entity, closing a chapter that had begun with such optimism. The reaction was one of muted disappointment. Developers who had invested a lot of time into the betas mourned the loss of a tool they believed they could have used one day to reshape computing. Analysts, meanwhile, debated the wisdom of Microsoft's ambition. Some lauded the attempt to innovate, while others criticized the overreach. For most users, the cancellation passed largely unnoticed. WinFS had never reached their hands, remaining a distant dream known only to those who follow the intricacies of technology and beta development. Though WinFS never landed on the desktops of the world, its influence reverberated through Microsoft's subsequent endeavors. The project's emphasis on metadata and relationships found a home in SQL Server, enhancing its capacity to manage unstructured data alongside traditional records. Windows Vista introduced Windows Search, a feature that indexed files and offered improved retrieval. Less ambitious than WinFS, but a clear descendant of its ideas. These advancements underscored a truth. WinFS may have faltered, but the concepts that drove it were sound. For example, the indexing technology in Windows Search, which allows faster file lookups, borrowed directly from WinFS's meta-driven approach and later evolved into Cortana and Windows 10's search capabilities. Outside Microsoft, the broader industry also felt the ripples. Cloud storage platforms like OneDrive and Google Drive adopted metadata-driven organization and synchronization, echoing WinFS's vision of a connected data ecosystem. Modern databases increasingly blur the lines between the structured and the unstructured sections of data, a trend WinFS anticipated by decades. Even the ubiquitous search bars of today's operating systems owe some debt to the relational querying WinFS championed. Companies like Apple also drew inspiration with macOS's Spotlight Search and iOS Photos app using metadata to enable queries like Show Me Photos from Last Summer's Beach Trip, a direct echo of WinFS's vision. The project's legacy is also one of cautionary wisdom. It illuminated the perils of reimagining foundational technologies in an ecosystem bound by legacy and expectation. File systems are not mere components, they are the bedrock upon which applications and user habits rest. WinFS also highlighted the critical role of timing. Its resource demands outstrip the hardware of the day, a mismatch that might not exist in the era of multi-core processors and abundant memory. Today with SSDs, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and cloud-back storage as standard, WinFS's vision seems far more feasible, suggesting that its failure was partly a matter of being too early for its era. What then is the moral of the WinFS tale? Well, it's a story of bold imagination tempered by the realities of execution, a reminder that even the grandest visions must contend with the realities and the constraints of the present. Microsoft dared to peer into a future where having a lot of data was not a liability, but actually an asset, the future where the digital detritus of our lives could be tamed and understood. That it did not succeed does not diminish their endeavor, rather it underscores the courage required to pursue such a path. In 2025, with AI-driven assistance and machine learning, we're much closer to realizing WinFS's dream as tools like Copilot and Gemini can infer relationships and contexts from data in ways that WinFS could only aspire to. Perhaps its true triumph lies not in what it became, but what it inspired. A recognition that the way we store our digital lives must evolve to keep pace with the needs that that data creates. WinFS was a pioneer, a harbinger of possibilities yet to be fully realized. And in that end, its story endures, a mostly forgotten lesson from a time when Microsoft reached for the stars, even if it never quite touched them. If you found today's look back at WinFS to be any combination of informative or entertaining, remember I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to the channel to help push me over that 1 million mark. And if you already count yourself among the subscribers, thank you. I'll also be interested in hearing from you on what you think about aspects of WinFS and how you think some of them may still be relevant today, like how would you like to be able to search for your data on your own machine, regardless of what's being used under the covers? For example, would you want a system that automatically tags your files with metadata and AI-generated things like family, vacation, or work project to make searching that much more effective? Let me know, and then check out this week's episode of Shop Talk for the answers. A link will be in the video description. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime, and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Lynn! Do it, do it!